I've had a chance to look back at some of the photographs and uh, reflect on the mission and it, it was just truly a wonderful experience. Uh, several highlights, you know, just arrival on the space station and suddenly floating through to this area that feels really familiar. The spacewalk was definitely probably the, the greatest highlight. All right, gentlemen, looking great. Glad to see you both out there together on the tip of the world. Tim, welcome back. Thank you. How does it feel to be back? Was it everything you hoped for? Uh, it was everything and more, definitely. The space station is a remarkable place to live and work, and it's you know it's very exciting. You're always being challenged. Um, you're never bored, and and so it's a great place to be. Tim Peake is Britain's first publicly funded astronaut. For just over six months, he was a crew member on board the International Space Station, carrying out experiments in microgravity, monitoring how his body changed, and inspiring the next generation of scientists, all while travelling at 17,000 miles an hour in orbit around the Earth. Thank you, European Space Agency and TES Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications. When you first get up into space, um, you're looking down and you're, you're kind of just trying to work out where you are and orientate yourself and get used to this 16 orbits a day. Once you've been up I caught up with Tim at the European Astronaut Centre in Cologne, Germany, where he completed some of his training. It's an exercise. Yeah, so this was, machine. Uh, this was a first generation. And he showed me around a replica space station module, similar to where he'd lived and worked. I can't imagine you're going to be able to answer this easily. Your highlights. Uh, several highlights, um, the, you know, just arrival on the space station and suddenly floating through to this area that feels really familiar because you've trained for so long in modules that are so accurate. Like this? It's, yeah, it's like a home from home, but to be floating around in this space and then to go to the cupola, the first view of planet Earth from, from on board the space station, the spacewalk was definitely probably the, the greatest highlight. Um, but also things like capturing the Dragon spacecraft, the visiting vehicle that I had to capture. Um, that was re a really a very demanding moment, so I, I was really um, very happy to, to do that. Was there ever a moment you just thought, I just want to go home, I want to come back early? No, absolutely not, no. And in fact, the mission got extended once whilst we were up there. We, we were extended for a further two weeks. And towards the end of the mission, there was the, there was the potential we were going to get extended again for a further two weeks uh, because of the delay to the new rocket launch. And, and on both occasions, we were, myself and the other crew members were all delighted. We were fine. OK, that's the centrifuge stopped. The door is now unlocked. There we have our two tubes. What was the biggest challenge for you? Because for Joe Blocks, for me, I would have thought actually just not being able to touch grass or go out and feel the sun on my face, mm. the simple things. What was the biggest challenge for you up there? Um, well, you're, you're really busy. The busy, biggest challenge is actually just uh, being a good crew member, and that means managing your time, being efficient, making sure that you're not making any mistakes. Um, you might be only working for 30 minutes one morning on, on some small experiment, but there's hundreds of people, that's their experiment, and they've spent hours and hours and hours, and it's extremely precious to them. So it might just be 30 minutes, but you cannot afford to make a mistake. So the biggest challenge is really just being on, on top of your game for so long, for six months. Did you make a mistake? Uh, you make small errors. Thankfully, I didn't make any mistakes that damaged science. Uh, so, uh, so no, everything went smoothly. Was it strange seeing your family and friends for the first time? Because you've been away, and it, you know, whenever you're away out of your natural environment, you learn to be independent and do a different thing, and almost put them in a box, don't you, in your head. What's it like kind of reintegrating with your family? You know, it's been remarkably easy, and I think part of that is because I've had such great contact with my family once, whilst I was on board the space station. Once a week, I'd have a uh, video conference with them, um, and I was able to, to phone my wife whenever I wanted to. So you feel a very close connection anyway to the family. Of course, uh, especially with two young children, you're reintegrating back in. It takes a, a little bit of a while, but it was really quite simple. Does Daddy rule the nest back home with the kids? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think Daddy's ever ruled the nest back home, but that's definitely <laughs> Mummy's domain. But uh, no, it's definitely great, great to be back as a family. And are you back in the routine of putting the trash out, etc., etc.? Right from the from where the word go, yes. So no special treatment at home. You are None. just Daddy and husband. Absolutely, yeah.
What did you learn about yourself that surprised you from being on the International Space Station for six months? Um, I'm not sure I've really learned anything new about myself, and I think that's partly that because of, of what we go through in preparation for the mission, and of course our previous careers. And um, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to get into space. It's a unique perspective to look down on the Earth. Um, but we, you know, really, I think in terms of, of my, my character and my personality, I don't think it's changed that much since coming back. Timothy Piki. Tim was chosen from more than 8,000 applicants for the job. He'd responded to an ad posted by the European Space Agency in spring 2008. I've primarily been flying the Apache, test, uh, Apache helicopter for uh, 10 years, and uh, I've got about over 3,000 hours. At the time, he was a test pilot for a helicopter firm, and before that he'd spent 18 years in the military, mostly flying helicopters. The astronaut screening process took a year. His intense basic training lasted another 14 months. After that, there was more advanced training to prepare him for life and work on the ISS. So Tim, I've um, got you into your sleeping den. Um, I I'm quite intrigued. What, what do we have in here? Yeah, so this is an astronaut's crew quarter. It's actually a little bit larger than the one on board. Not, not, not much, though. This uh, is larger? Oh, it's slightly larger. So this larger. is a roomy, like a king-size yeah, deluxe this is, bedroom, this is, is it? king-size <laughs> yeah. Well, we would have a, a couple of computers here that we would be able to, to work on. Uh, photographs of friends and family. It's where we sleep. Were there any, any moments you thought that could be something different, that could be something otherworldly? Uh, you, you do see some strange things, but normally, they, like everything, it has an explore, explanation to it. Um, I you know, saw a couple of uh, meteors coming into Earth, which was really cool to, to watch them. Um, you don't normally see lights out in space um, during the daytime. You see the stars at night, but during the daytime you don't normally see any other lights. And one time I was at the Cooper and I could see a couple of lights passing by the space station that looked like uh, either satellites or, or fast-moving objects, which was really quite strange, never seen that before. So I called one of my other crewmates over and we had a look at it, we were wondering what it was. Then we realised it wasn't actually far away from the space station, it was quite close to the space station, and it was in fact um, small droplets of liquid that were le leaking out of the progress module. Um, and they were passing, the sunlight was reflecting on these droplets of water. So, like I said, everything that's unusual normally has a, an explanation to it. But um, there are something like 500 films that have been played in the International Space Station um, since 1998, and so you got you get some downtime. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. watch any films like Alien or? I don't know, Gravity or Moon while you were up there. You know, you're working very hard and it's nice to come together as a crew. Also, you're working individually a lot, although there's six of you on board. Um, so you know, once a week, it's nice to come together with your Russian colleagues and just ha have a movie or have a shared meal together. So um, with Scott Ke Kelly, when he was commander, when we first got on board, he'd been saving the new Star Wars for us. So that was one of the first movies we watched up there, which was, was great just uh, you know, to make it a special evening on board the space station. So movie night with popcorn, which I can imagine will be floating <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of all the things to be in a zero gravity or near zero gravity environment, perhaps not the ideal food. No, no, anything that's uh, <laughs> going to be crumbly is not good for space flight. Breakfast this morning, scrambled eggs. In about, about five minutes, it'll be ready to eat. There have been some comments about you, the ISS, and the Nobel Peace Prize. Do you want to expand on that? Well, the, the International Space Station was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize uh, because of the international cooperation for so many years. Um, and even dating back before the International Space Station, of course, space flight in general was, a, uh, was wonderful in terms of cooperation between, in particular, between the US and Russia. Uh, but in, in terms of the International Space Station now, of course, we have all the partners who are involved. Um, and that's been since 1998, the first modules flew. Uh, it's been occupied since 2000, so over, over 16 years of human occupation. Um, astronauts from so many different nations around the world 
all working towards the same goal, the same, same science object objectives, the same exploration objectives. Uh, so I think it really is very worthy of a, a Nobel Peace Prize in those respects. So this is the cupola, Tim? Yeah, this is the cupola. This is in uh, node three, and um, it's really our, our window on Earth. It's, it's uh, facing, obviously. Um, and uh, it's just a wonderful place to go to take photographs, or just if you just want five minutes to yourself, you know, have a coffee and look at the, literally look at the world go by. Can't ask for a better view, really, can you? No, it is, it's magnificent. And um, you get to the stage, you actually challenge yourself. When you first get up into space, um, you're looking down and you're, you're kind of just trying to work out where you are and orientate yourself and get used to this 16 orbits a day. Once you've been up a couple of months, you wouldn't even uh, need to look at the map where you are. You'd look out the window and you'd be able to tell, well, this is, this is Africa and I can see that right now we're over Africa. Nothing else looks like it. <clears throat> and then um, judging by where the orbits are, you would kind of say, oh, we're over South America. Great. So 25 minutes, it will be over Europe because we're on an ascending node. You would just kind of get used to the odd look out of the window and being able to know where you were where over the world just by looking out. We uh, voted, the country has voted to leave the European Union. Now as a British astronaut, as part of the European Space Agency, tell mm. me how you think that might work or what you think might be the advantages or disadvantages going forward. Yes, yeah, so certain, as a, from a point of view of the European Space Agency, the, the UK's participation is not affected by this EU referendum. Uh, European Space Agency is a separate entity with its member states, so the UK is still firmly uh, a member of the, the European Space Agency. And uh, we'll hopefully, we'll see in the Ministerial coming up later this year, but we'll hopefully continue to participate in the International Space Station program as well. Um, what we do have to be careful, of course, is, is science, which uh, will be affected by the EU referendum. And I know that there are many people involved in science in the UK who are concerned about how uh, that's going to be affected. So there are certainly many areas that we need to be focusing on as we move forward and trying to, to make the, the best for Britain out of this decision. Science experiments now, you've spoken about these, you said you haven't made any mistakes in, and ruined any science. This is something you were really passionate about before you um, went up and you've engaged a lot with children as well, school children around the, the country as well. What experiments have excited you the most? Yes, well, I mean, I think all astronauts are, are really engaged in the science because that's what we're going up there to do. Um, we get to do other highlights like spacewalks and robotics operations um, and doing a lot of maintenance, but really science is the focus of our activity. Um, some of the things that uh, are really exciting are the, the ones that we participate in more, nothing more so than the life science because it's our human body. So um, you get remarkably good at, at being an ultrasound operator, for example, um, ultrasound of the eye, of the cardiovascular system, of all all the arteries and veins in your body. Uh, we're learning an awful lot about that. Um, and also, uh, for example, airway monitoring, that was a really great experiment, looking at airway inflammation and, and how we can measure that on board the space station and how that will benefit people who suffer from asthma back on Earth. So those experiments, I think, that really relate to um, benefits to people on Earth really excited me. You took your own blood up there, didn't Many you? times, yeah, yeah, take our own blood, and, and that's on a regular uh, occurrence throughout our, our duration on board the space station. Um, with children being so excited about science, what do you hope they're going to have learned from you? Because you interacted with lots of them, didn't you, in mm. growing certain plants and seeds? That's right, yes, we you know, try to interact with children on so many levels and really to try and encourage them to look at science and technology, engineering and maths in, in a new light, trying to see that it can be exciting, it can be fun, it can lead to great careers uh, and also we need new scientists and engineers to, to solve many of the challenges that we face. These bats are hydrophobic, which means they resist the water so the water doesn't stick to them. They're like non-sticky bats, which means that you can actually play space ping pong. There you go. We can have games on a Saturday and play space ping pong. But also on a more lighter level, we are just trying to use space and the mission to excite kids to, to be inspired into whatever it is that they like to do. Um, so that's why we included things like the mission patch design, uh, fitness and nutrition, so many exercises there. That, you, know, you mentioned the growing rocket seeds as well, music and art, um, all those kind of areas, just to try and really use space to inspire kids. Did you like science when you were a child? I did, yeah. I, I love science and of course that really uh, led on to my career in aviation and, and, and learning about physics and learning about aviation, I could really relate the two together. And there you can see the bubble is starting to grow 
all of the gas is being released. You've inspired, I'm sure you won't be surprised, I'm sure you'd be very pleased here, you've inspired lots of children um, who've been following your mission. So we went back to your primary school, um, <laughs> Westbourne Primary School, and we've filmed with some of the children there and they've sent you a message. Would you like to see this oh, I'd video? I'd love to see it, right, yes okay, please. Did yeah. you just press play there? Okay. <laughs> Major Tim, we would like to show you how we've been learning about space. Hi Tim, this is a rocket that we've made in honour of you. This is Thin Tim. We call him Thin Tim because he's on paper and he's been watching over all of our assemblies. This is our polytunnel. This is where we grew our rocket seeds, some of which have been into space. That's brilliant. The, the school hasn't changed that much. <laughs> I've been inspired by him telling, well, telling everyone that he wasn't the best at school. That's very true. But that just shows that we can do anything if we just try hard. Is it true you can see the Great Wall of China from space? Can you have a bath or a shower in the ISS? Wow, I can see I'm going to have to get back to Westbourne Primary School to answer those questions. They've great, great questions, though, and that's a lovely, that's a lovely message. Good morning, it's Saturday the 18th of June. Also ahead, Tim Peake's six-month space mission comes to an end. In the last few hours, you can see here the British astronaut has boarded the spacecraft that's going to bring him back down to Earth. See you on the ground. See you soon. On June 18th, Tim and two crewmates said their goodbyes and left the space station. Their return journey reached speeds 25 times faster than sound. We are just uh, eight and a half minutes away from touchdown. They landed in the desert in Kazakhstan. Shortly afterwards, Tim said it was remarkable, the best ride he'd ever been on. It's been incredible, it really has. I'm just so grateful for all the support and uh, yeah, thank you for everybody who's helped with this mission. Tell us about that journey, the actual journey in. Yes, the journey in, um, actually, you know, the undocking and the, uh, the preparation for re-entry, it's all very smooth and fairly slow, but then it's really in the last 40 minutes where things start to happen. So the, the main thing is that big engine burn that slows you down. And you, once you've burnt that engine, you're coming back to Earth regardless, no matter what. Uh, then the, sp the spacecraft has to separate. It blows itself apart with the pyrotechnic bolts. And we're left with just the, the capsule with the three of us in it that's going to come back to Earth. How does that feel when it blows itself apart with pyrotechnic bolts? You, you need to be ready for it. If you're not ready for it, then it will really take you by surprise. It's very loud. Um, and it's a number of bolts going off, just like a, a heavy machine gun. And actually, the, the spacecraft rocks and then kind of you feel it get thrown, thrown aside because it separates you know with uh, with some propulsion the capsule will start slowly tumbling and at that point you're simply waiting to uh, for the atmosphere to start slowing you down and it will be the atmosphere that then orientates the capsule in the right direction with the heat shield first and and yes there's flames come past at, at first because as you start to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere anything that can burn on the outside of the spacecraft will burn so flames come past and then um, as the g-load builds up it turns into plasma so actually the windows start to, to burn over and to start to brown over as well but you, you know you're expecting that you've been told about it so it, it doesn't come as too much as a surprise What was your first meal? You know, the first meal was actually on the aircraft that was bringing me back from Kazakhstan. And I was delighted because they had prepared some British tea bags for me. So I had a cup of tea with a little bit of salad, uh, cheese and biscuits. And that's all you actually want because mm. you're still not feeling great. So it was really just kind of simple foods. Um, but to have that first cup of tea on the aircraft was really great. And then afterwards it was, I went for pizza, not salad. What was it like sleeping in your own bed? Because we've seen the pod here where you're mm. sleeping. I think when you slept in your sleeping bag, you were untethered, weren't mm. you? you? So you were just floating around sleeping? Well, just kind of loosely tethered, but, yeah. but makes, I, I like to be floating more than restrained. Some people like to really kind of strap themselves in quite tightly. Uh, I was quite more happy kind of floating around. So but, back in your own bed? Yeah, back in your own bed, it's, it takes a while to get used to, and you, you're feeling the pressure points very heavily. You know, you really feel gravity. Everything feels so heavy. So you end up tossing and turning a lot more because it's uncomfortable to be on any one spot for too long. 
Have you had a good, had, have you had a good night's sleep then? I so have had a good night's sleep, yeah. Again, it only really takes three or four nights before you uh, slot back into life on Earth. I want to talk about you and what next. Can I, are you still employed? Is it, is it mission accomplished or have you no. still got an official job? Uh, yes, I, I was employed in 2009 as a European Space Agency astronaut and continue to be so. It's a career um, and that goes for all of my, the, my colleagues who I joined up with, uh, the 2009 class of shenanigans, my, my five <laughs> other friends. So, and in fact, uh, Alex Guest uh, has already been reassigned to his second mission from, from my class. He'll fly in 2019 and he'll command the space station. Uh, so we all continue to be employed as astronauts and um, after I've done the post-flight science objectives and the post-flight tour, I'll go back to being a flight status astronaut and eligible for a further assignment as well. So you'd go back? Absolutely. If the opportunity arose, there's a potential to go back either to the International Space Station or to some of the exciting missions that are coming up in the 2020s. We're looking at uh, our collaboration with NASA, the Orion project, which will be returning to the moon. Would you go back next month if you could? Uh, next month, if I could, I'd like to spend a bit more time with the family first before going back that, that soon. I think Rebecca and the boys would appreciate that yeah. answer as well. So the gym, this yeah. is where you have spent, what, all of the last few weeks since you've been back? Are you back up to full <coughs> strength now, as you were before you left? I feel like I am, and in fact, um, for example, the muscles in my back are actually better, in better condition now than they were pre-launch, but in certain areas it's going to take a lot longer, and, and for my bone density to fully recover, that'll probably take one to two years. You ran the marathon mm. up in space, how was it? It was actually not, not as bad as I was anticipating. So you've had lots of accolades and congratulations for running the marathon, but you never got a medal, did you? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I didn't actually run the London Marathon. It's the digital version of the London Marathon. So. Well, the Virgin Money London Marathon thinks you did run the marathon. And may I put <laughs> oh, this on you? I'm going to yeah, pop this down great. because you do at last have oh, a medal wonderful. for running the London Marathon. It's all you yours. Much. Congratulations. That is brilliant. Thank you very much. Are you going to take it off today? No, I'm not. I'm going to keep it on there. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, well done. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Likewise, thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks very much. Okay, so yeah, I'll just go into a ball and start spinning. And then if uh, if you want to just keep me go round and... Uh, on axis. Yeah, yeah, on axis, that's cool. Well, actually, it's, it's more provocative when you go off axis. Yeah, I'm not that's, sure I could even control it. Yeah, no, don't worry. Provocative's fine. <laughs> just keep it going. A lot faster. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's go for it.